and I'm going to turn off the music first before it starts so that we don't run into the same issue um, again. Look at that. All right. And then I am ready whenever you are. We can go ahead and get started. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our new final day of the Week 7 Virtual Chautauqua Lecture Series on Korean Religion and Culture. My name is Dakota Harkins, and I'm the Director of Education and Heritage Programming here at Lakeside Chautauqua. As a quick reminder, anyone who happened to have missed any of the programs from earlier this week on Korean Religion and Culture, those are available on the Lakeside Chautauqua Facebook and also on the Lakeside website. If you go to lakesideohio.com backslash calendar and select the purple banner at the top of the date for the program that you wish to watch, it'll take you to another page that has all of the links to the Zoom programs that we've recorded from previous weeks even. So you can go back and watch those whenever you would like. Um, without further ado, I am so happy to be welcoming back our speaker from the beginning of this week who is here with us, uh, Dr. Miro Swong. Dr. Wong is an associate professor of history and uh, program coordinator for Asian studies minor at Hiram College. And fortunately, she has decided to come back again with us today and offer a program on North Korea. So welcome back, Dr. Wong. It's so good to have you. Thank you, Dakota. Such a delight to be uh, asked to come back for a third day. This has uh, been a, such a, so much fun for me. Um, and uh, I've very much enjoyed getting to communicate with your um, community there at Lakeside Chautauqua um, and uh, I'm very excited to also give this other lecture a little bit uh, different than the religion and culture lecture on North Korea which has been a topic of interest of mine uh, in the past uh, few years and so um, this is a really uh, great opportunity for me to share this information with you. Before I start this lecture, I want to give an acknowledgement to the people and the foundations that made this particular research possible. Um, first is the North Korean Curriculum Workshop uh, at the NAM Center for Korean Studies um, at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. I participated in this curriculum workshop in 2017, and then uh, a handful of us from various institutions that were participating have continued to uh, develop our uh, North Korean curriculum group uh, ever since then. And I should especially thank Professor, Professor Nojin Kwok, the director of the NAM Center. Um, he and his administration, uh, administrative supporters have been such an incredible uh, help to me and they've been incredibly generous to us. So I thank them for that. I'd also like to give thanks to uh, Professor James Thompson, uh, my colleague at in the political science department at Hiram College and the Garfield Center for Public Leadership for sponsoring our foreign diplomacy tour that we took last year in March. The topic for today will be on North Korea, um, uh, understanding North Korea through its modern history. Um, but really I'll be examining today North Korean historiography as a historian, we use this idea of historiography quite often. Historiography is basically um, the historical method. Um, so it's not necessarily just the history itself or the past events themselves, but rather the way that that history is remembered, the way that it's written about and recalled, the way that um, the methods that are used to produce that history. Um, that is what I'm thinking about in this for today's lecture. And through that historiography, we're really looking through the North Korean lens here at um, how they understand their own country's past through pre-modern territorial developments, uh, standing back from the, the Mongols um, all the way into the, the Hideyoshi invasions of the 16th century uh, and all of those conflicts in the pre-modern period. And then we'll be moving our attention to the Japanese imperial rise under the new age of empires in the, at the turn of the century uh, that then also uh, immediately uh, uh, resulted in Japanese colonialism in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, we'll shift our attention to the really important part of the middle 20th century in the civil war that ensued into the Korean War. And then the, um, from the 1960s onward, the Cold War legacies and that historiography. So we'll be understanding North Korea through that, those events in its history. To begin, 
North Korean textbooks describe Korea as a country uh, that, na that neighbors wanted to steal since the very beginning of the country. They talk about the Mongols wanting to take over in the 13th century, and especially um, important to them is this pre-modern Japanese invasion. So if you look on the lower right-hand side of this map, you'll see in the southeastern uh, coastal area of the Korean Peninsula, this is the area where there were a series of battles, that naval battles that ensued between uh, the Japanese warlord Toyotomi Hideyoshi and, uh, and Korea in the late 16th century. The Japanese uh, were able to reach uh, the Korean shores uh, with the assistance of the Portuguese ships and firearms um, that had invaded this area. But Yi Sun Shin, uh, Admiral Yi Sun Shin's naval campaign was successful in, in, in fending off those invasions in this uh, summer of 1952. Uh, from the North Korean perspective, this was seen as an immense victory for Korea. Admiral Yi Sun Shin is celebrated there as a national hero, quite the same as, it, as he is in, in South Korea. This is an image of the Turtle Boat restaurant in Pyongyang, in uh, the capital city of North Korea. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go there, the food there is supposed to be quite good. Um, so in North Korean historiography, Japan stands out as a constant enemy. We move on to looking at then the, the Sino-Japanese War of 1895. This is seen as the beginning of Japan's rise as an evil empire, where they were really successful at expanding their empire. To understand this context, uh, we should go back to the Opium Wars in China, the two wars that ended in 1942 and 1960. These wars were primarily fought between China, England, and France. The war treaty that, that awarded concessions um, to those countries, they also then awarded them to the United States, Russia, and, uh, and a couple other Western, Western countries. These concessions cut up China's eastern seaboard among foreign extraterritorialities, then making China into a semi-colonial nation. Uh, this image uh, from a, Jap uh, a French um, illustrator really depicts this situation uh, quite is interestingly. Uh, they call it the Chinese pie. You've got uh, Queen Victoria here facing off with Wilhelm II, the German Prussian king because um, they were at that time undergoing some territorial disputes. You've got uh, the French Marianne in very close relationship with, uh, with the Nicholas II from Russia and showing that Franco-Russian alliance. And then you also have Japan here uh, represented as Japanese samurai with a sword kind of off to the side, uh, contemplating the pieces that he wants to take. Meanwhile, in the background, we've got this, um, this Chinese Mandarin uh, official who is you know, throwing up his arms in a kind of powerless protest. What's most interesting here is that Japan was initiating its interest in acquiring this piece of the pie after the Second Opium War. How do they do this? Well, they created this thing called the Meiji Restoration in 1868. British and war German technology were used to then develop uh, Japanese naval technology quite successfully uh, so they were able to attack Korea and uh, force them into a treaty, the first unequal trade treaty that was very similar to these treaties out of the Opium War and known as the Kanghua Treaty. So now they were able to have the seat at the table of world imperialists. North Korean revolutionaries see this as the same time as a, the roots of, of Korea's grassroots nationalism. Uh, where uh, North Korean peasant armies were developing uh, and demanding for national reform and demanding that the country secure its interests away from, Jap uh, from foreign intrusions. So the, what we talked about in previous lectures about the, the Tonghak army, the Eastern Learning Army, uh, that then also formed the, the a Heavenly Way Church in South and North Korea, uh, that Tonghak army uh, in the, at the turn of the century were, was making demands to reform Korean domestic and foreign policies. Um, and they actually overtook the Choson court. And from that period of, of invasion, then uh, the Chinese were called to assist in controlling the Tonghak. And as a result, the Japanese also entered. By some historians account, this war that ensued between the Chinese and Japanese on the Korean Peninsula was considered the third of such wars, a third Sino-Japanese war that was fought, fought over the peninsula. Um, 
if you talk to uh, to uh, some Han Che Bong at the Asan Institute for Policy Studies, uh, this would be his argument. This is one of the series of proxy wars that were fought on the Korean Peninsula. The outcome made international headlines because this was seen as the first time a non-white nation defeated the Great Middle Kingdom. Japan engaged in this war on the Korean Peninsula to initiate its race for real estate through the Asia Pacific region. Um, at the conclusion of this war then, they wrote in the first article, the very most important thing, that quote, China recognizes definitively a full and complete independence and autonomy of Korea. And in consequence, the payment of tributes and the performance of ceremonies and formalities by Korea to China that are in derogation of such independence and autonomy shall wholly cease for the future. Why would they make this the first clause of that treaty? Well, basically what it was going to do then was it would force Korea to cut its ties from China, that big brother country that had been there with, for them militarily, economically for millennia. It was going to cut off that relationship. Also from the treaty, then Japan acquired Taiwan, uh, then known as Formosa, the, Chinese, the Portuguese word uh, for Taiwan. Um, they also acquired the coveted Liaodong Peninsula. So if you recall from my previous lecture, that was the northernmost warm water bay in the Pacific, right next to the Korean Peninsula. Once that happens, Russia interrupts the settlement and they force Japan to give the Liaodong Peninsula back to China. Because Japan is forced to do this, the Japanese rebel all throughout the country. There are mass rebellions against Jap uh, Russian intervention and Japan prepares to go to war with Russia. And also in the conclusion of the war, the Japanese execute the leaders of the Tonghak movement, the, um, the Eastern Learning Army, the Righteous Army leaders, and that Righteous Army has to go underground. And these are all documented then in North Korean history books. The caption at the bottom of this cartoon reads, the Korean government has decided to preserve a strict neutrality in the event that war would happen between Japan and Russia. That is a quote from the daily paper. Japan fights Russia in Manchuria and sees surrounding the Korean Peninsula, which Koreans could see as another kind of proxy war on the Korean Peninsula. Tsar Nicholas II underestimated completely Japan's determination and Japan wins this war. Again, internationally, people are shocked by this victory. As a Result of this war, then, the Treaty of Portsmouth is signed in which Japan acquires a protectorate status over Korea, and they take back the Laodong Peninsula. Around the same time that the Treaty of Portsmouth was signed, uh, a secret agreement was arranged between the United States and Japan. The United States Secretary of War, William Taft, and Japanese Prime Minister Katsuro Taro signed a taft katsuro agreement in which Japan recognized United States interests in the Philippines if the United States would recognize Japan's sphere of influence over Korea. Five years after the Treaty of Portsmouth was signed, Japan conquered Korea. From the North Korean perspective, this formal colonization of Korea was the most devastating event in its history and it begins what I call North Korea's defensive nationalism. This was in my mind, perhaps the most forceful form of colonialism that the 20th, 20th century had seen. So on the Korean Peninsula were land surveys where they redistributed land in a way that would eliminate all the geomantic uh, markers and the sacred sites and directions that the Koreans had traditionally um, held on to. They also then created a very aggressive education reform campaign in which Korean content would be completely eliminated from the curriculum, from the public education curriculum, and Koreans were forced to speak Japanese. They also instated these things called the name change laws in which Koreans were then forced to uh, relinquish their Korean names and take on Japanese names. Uh, you could imagine how um, devastating that was for the people in the Hojok system, the family registry system that they had had held on to for, for hundreds of years. Um, they also instated a Japanese religion called Shinto, 
erected uh, national Shinto shrines in Korea and then would uh, document the the Koreans that would come and and uh, pay homage to the Shinto shrines. The most egregious, perhaps, of all of the policies that were put into place was the wartime volunteerism policy in which every member of the Japanese Empire, it didn't matter if you're a child, a woman, or an old person, uh, you would have to volunteer for the empire. Um, and among those, the one that probably most people in the international community remember is the comfort women system where women were then smuggled and forced into sexual slavery for the Japanese Imperial Army. So those events are recalled very clearly in, in Korea's um, history. Japan fought on the side of the Entente powers in World War I, and they secured the sea lanes in the Western Pacific and Indian Oceans against Germany. So um, from the US's perspective, they were an ally. When World War I ended with the Paris Versailles Convention, uh, with Japan as one of the five major powers, Korea was entering its first decade of this very harsh form of colonization. They sent a secret mission to participate in the Paris Convention. The Versailles Convention then failed to recognize Korea's sovereignty from Japan, and Woodrow Wilson re responded to their initiative by saying, declaring that Korea would get its independence, quote, in due course. In due course meant that there were no promises that Korea would gain its independence. So in spring of that year, um, following a funeral procession in which the last king of the Joseon dynasty, King Kojong, was um, being, uh, being honored. After that procession was over, suddenly it ignited a grassroots uprising against Japanese colonialism in what is known in both North and South Korea as the March 1st Independence Movement or Liberation Day. The provisional government of the Republic of Korea was then established in Shanghai uh, a month after this, and other satellite offices were then established in places like Philadelphia, in Hawaii, and uh, other parts of, of Asia. You can't talk about North Korean history without talking about Kim Il-sung's biography. His life becomes a part of the history of the nation. Kim Il-sung was born, Kim Sung-ju, on April 15th of 1912 in Southern Korea. So this first, he was born in that first decade of colonial rule. His family fled to Manchuria in 1920, and then they settled in Jilin, China in 1926. So as a young man, uh, Kim Il-sung became fluent in Chinese and could be seen as a Korean Chinese by this point. He joined the Chinese Communist Party in 1931 and changed his name to Kim Il-sung a few years later. In 1935, he raided an area called Pocheonbo, which in their history books is seen as a massive victory against the Japanese in the area of Manchuria. Um, as a result of his military uh, successes, he was recognized by the Soviets and made a major in a special unit of the Soviet Red Army in 1942. They appointed him then later as to be the chairman of the Korean Communist Party in 1945. And in a couple of years before the Korean War uh, emer erupted, uh, the United Nations elections were held in the South to many people's protests in the international community that it would exclude the North. Um, and the following year then, uh, Kim Il-sung was elected the vice president of the Workers' Party in 1949. The, some new research is indicating that North Korea has had quite complicated relationships with China, that it wasn't a very stable relationship. Um, and we'll see that in his in, in Kim Il Sung's biography as well. Um, the best example of that is perhaps the Min Sengdan purge. Min Sengdan was the People's Livelihood Corps, which was an organization that existed for the uh, Korean settlers in Manchuria. The Japanese Empire had created in incentives for Koreans to settle in Manchuria. 
there were up to about a million people, million Koreans that had settled into this region. The Minsingdan purge started out in Manchuria as a counter espionage struggle, and it degenerated into an anti Korean persecution conducted by the Japanese. Kim Il sung stated in his biography that Minsingdan is a specter. This represents the painful scream shouted by many Korean communists before dying unjust deaths on the false charges of being Min Sengdan members. The ultra leftist struggle against Min Sengdan caused great damage to our revolution, end quote. In this purge, Japan was not only suspecting Koreans of being Chinese spies, but Chinese were also suspecting Koreans of being Japanese spies. The Chinese purge uh, resulted in some thousand people, thousand Koreans being executed, um, and in that Kim Il-sung narrowly escaped. After Japan's unconditional surrender to the United States at the end of the Second World War in August of 1945, Korea experienced a few precious months of jubilation for regaining their national independence from Japan. Soviets appointed uh, Kim Il-sung as a chairman of the Communist Party at that year, and then in 46, various nationalist groups that had been percolating or underground or overseas then came back to surface in Korea. And it seems that one by one, a number of those political leaders mysteriously disappeared. Many suspect those were people were assassinated. Skirmishes of protests against foreign military occupations were also quelled. Um, and in the UN elections on the South um, that happened in 1948, then escalated into mass killings uh, throughout the Korean Peninsula. <clears throat> Kim Il Sung says that um, that uh, Mao Zedong didn't want to get involved in this conflict. He was uh, he thought it was too messy, and he was also fighting his own civil war at this time, um, and he resented Mao for this. He said that without China's support, they launched that attack on the South in June of 1950. Um, but had they supported Kim's efforts. Uh, that they would have further enabled their ability to reunify the country. But that is not to say that the Chinese did not uh, have make great sacrifices in that war. Chinese lost nearly a million soldiers to the Korean War, a uh, number that many of us don't recognize here in the United States. They lost the most casualties, second to North Koreans. Um, Mao Zedong even lost his first son, Mao Anying, uh, in an air raid uh, in the Korean War. The Korean War was as brutal as the Vietnamese War, uh, but had proportionally higher casualties. In the first three months after the official start of the war, 97,000 tons of bombs and 7.8 million gallons of napalm were dropped. Uh, these are some data and statistics and information that we gathered from Marilyn Young's um, work on, on the Korean War. Um, she passed away a few years ago, um, and it's really to our dismay. Um, in the spring of 1951, General Emmett O'Donnell, Chief Bomber Command, reported, quote, the entire, almost the entire Korean Peninsula is just a terrible mess. Everything is destroyed. There is nothing standing worth of the name. Just before the Chinese came in, we were grounded. There were no more targets in Korea. So that the that there I could read several quotes like this uh, from uh, U.S. Allied forces on what they witnessed on the Korean Peninsula. But this is to say that the Korean Peninsula was completely leveled um, through the these three years of fighting. On July 27, 1953. The Korean Armistice Agreement was signed in which people, uh, the parties involved, agreed to lay down arms. Uh, this was signed by the United States Army Lieutenant General William Harrison Jr., who was representing the United Nations Command, North Korean General Man I, who represented the Korean People's Army and Chinese People's Volunteer Army. Absent from the signing was South Korean uh, administrative offices of Sigmund Rhee. Sigmund Rhee continued to push for military reunification of the country. The July 27, 1953 armistice agreements documented around the world, including in Cleveland's own plane, de plane dealer, 
um, as a uh, cease of hostilities. Uh, but it was a very unsettling sign, uh, unsettling moment for Koreans um, because of the, the what it would mean for the unification, the lack of inability to reunify the country. In 1954, at a Geneva conference, Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai suggested a peace treaty be implemented on the Korean Peninsula. He failed in that suggestion. United States Secretary of State John Foster Dulles refused to negotiate a peace treaty and faced a lot of criticism for it. So the de facto new border ceasefire along a demilitarized zone then became the permanent uh, boundary separating a North from South Korea. After three years of fighting, civilian death tolls in the North was about 2 million people. What many Americans have called the Forgotten War, North Koreans have called the Liberation War. This may be a clear departure from the U.S., but it's also, it also diverges from South Korean depictions of the war in that North Koreans consider this to be their year one of their modern era. They see it, their modernity starting with this war. They declare that they are the only true post-colonial nation, that no other foreign military occupies their country. Um, and they're intensely proud of this outcome of this war as one that demonstrates their strength and modern capabilities. The largest number of uh, deaths that came out of the war um, were pro they were probably militarily re related, but they're a so startlingly large number of civilian massacres that occurred in the years before and after the Korean War. And this is why many people are calling this a civil war um, as much, if not more, than it was a proxy war. Um, <clears throat> The uh, largest numbers in the count in the incidents that the South Korean scholars have have discovered um, are of the Jeju Island massacre um, uh, there, that happens right here in 1948, and the Podo massacre that happens here in 1950. The Podo League massacre. There are some hundred to two hundred thousand people that they have found buried in mass graves from this particular war. Documentation on this uh, was very difficult to find in South Korea, so they uh, scholars have had to resort to, ironically, North Korean uh, sources. This is the Nodongja Shimun, which is the workers' daily newspaper um, that documented many of these massacres uh, in fairly accurate accounts. And so those have been referenced for forensics teams and other um, scholars working to recover this history. After Joseph Stalin died, Mao Zedong and Kim Il-sung both denied Nikita Khrushchev's Soviet revisionism. They went against Khrushchev's proposal for coexistence of socialism and capitalism. Once the Soviets backed out of establishing their missile sites on Cuba in, in the Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962, Pyongyang abandoned all hope for Soviet support for military-backed reunification. Then during Mao's Cultural Revolution, Kim moved even further away from China towards the Soviet Union while they tried to establish closer ties to third world countries. And so Kim Il-sung does this where he shifts between his, his uh, friendship and uh, distance from various countries. You see here, um, th this information was, uh, was gathered with the help of James Person at the School of Advanced International Studies, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, um, politically, Kim Il-sung was incredibly popular in the 40s. And then into the 50s, he, uh, he starts to eliminate a lot of the dissenting voices and consolidate the Workers' Party. Um, and the indigenization of communism then emerges around that same time in the, in the 60s, where he introduces the notion of Chuche, the self-reliance ideology. And then the Korean historiography changes to one of a guerrilla state looking at the various forms of revolutionary histories that, that could be traced back in Korean history. Economically, they fared very well. So they had a lot of Soviet aid in the beginning, in the reconstruction period after the war. Um, and they fared much better than South Korea did economically in the first couple decades after the war. They were also highly centralized with heavy industries as a focus. Then they shifted in the 70s and 80s into light industries 
and uh, bolstered their military and civilian economy um, in, in the early 70s onward. Some other new research has been, uh, that has been conducted in recent years uh, is about Korea's, North Korea's involvement in the Vietnam War, what the Vietnamese call the American War. This is a photo from the Wilson Center of North Korean military personnel in combat operations against the U.S. and allied forces during the Vietnam War. Kim Il-sung visited Ho Chi Minh in late 1958, in which he announced in a speech, Long live the unification of Vietnam. Long live the unification of Korea. Long live socialism. Long live world peace, end quote. On March 27, 1965, he officially announced their assistance in the war where he stated to his troops, fight the war as if the Vietnamese sky were your own. He provided substantial military and economic aid to North Vietnam. Um, and so in the early parts of those, uh, his contributions to the war, um, the relationship with, with Ho Chi Minh was quite strong, but that relationship deteriorated by 1968 when he believed that North Vietnam should not enter the, P the Paris Peace Accords. During the Cambodian Civil War, North Korea approved mainland Chinese plan to create five revolutionary country alliance. So in that Chinese proposal, they, uh, they proposed it should be China, North Korea, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. But North Korea rejected this plan because it excluded the Soviet Union and also because he disagreed with Vietnam, Vietnam's control of Indochina. Uh, as you know, in 1975, the government of North Vietnam succeeded in reunifying the whole country, but North Korea further criticized Vietnam for invading Cambodia and even allied with Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge to recognize Vietnam as a mutual enemy. So that uh, tension existed for several years, but then they, they regained their alliances with Vietnam. North Korean relations with non-Marxist regimes were first established with the Algerian National Liberation Front, the FLN, in 1958, as the FLN was in the midst of its own war against the French rule. That same year, Guinea became the first sub-Saharan African nation to establish diplomatic ties with Pyongyang. Other sub-Saharan African nations waited until the early 70s to develop those relationships when it was going to be possible to recognize both North and the South. In the 1960s and 70s, many African government officials and leaders who visited the DPRK praised North Korea's post-colonial and post-war reconstruction and sought to model their nations on Kim Il-sung's brand of socialism. So a good example of this is where an Ethiopian diplomat, a diplomat who visited North Korea remarked in 1976, quote, the political independence and economic self-reliance, which is resolutely defended by the Korean people, is an excellent model for the socialist Ethiopian people, end quote. Ben Young at the, the Wilson Center here states, uh, quote, in the 1960s and 70s, many third world leaders, particularly Africans, looked to the DPRK and sought a polit political system that was distinct from Western and Soviet styles of rule. North Korea, a small post-colonial colonial third world country with its strong leadership, a disciplined populace, rapid post-war reconstruction, and an ideology centered on self-reliance was an alluring model to many African authorities. Numerous Asian, African, and Latin American nations established close relations with the North and found its flexible use of Marxism-Leninism and this Chuche ideology quite enticing. So in particular, the Cuban leadership formed a close relationship with North Korea based on third world internationalism and commitment to supporting an anti-colonial guerrilla struggle around the world. Here you see depicted Che Guevara, a leading proponent of third world worldism. He was visiting North Korea and met with Kim Il-sung twice in the early 60s. And in the fall, he, he said this was an example of Asian socialism. Um, he appeared on Cuban tel television discussing his trip where he praised North Korea for its achievements in heavy industry. Just weeks before the Bay of Pigs invasion in April, on April 17, 1961, Guevara spoke with an independent journalist, I.F. Stone, where Stone commented, reflecting back on that interview, Che spoke with an enthusiasm of what he had seen in his grand tour of the Soviet bloc. What impressed him most was the reconstruction of North Korea and the quality of its industrial output. Here was a tiny country resurrected from the ashes of American bombardment and invasion." End quote. <clears throat> 
Raul Castro, Fidel's brother and second secretary to Cuban Politburo, visited DPRK in 1966 and emphasized their close relationship as well. From so in the 60s, from 1962 to 1965, the DPRK, uh, with its booming economy, also increased its military spending from 6% to 30%. 1966, they overhauled the party members to consolidate the Korean Workers' Party. Um, in the following year, along the demilitarized zone, incidents of skirmishes increased by 11-fold. So this is all happening during the Vietnam War. The following year, the Korean People's Army Commando Unit infiltrated Seoul and launched an attack on the Blue House. That same year, what you see in this image in the slide, uh, this U.S. Pueblo was captured. The USS Pueblo was a naval intelligence spy ship that the North Korean forces attacked and captured in the Eastern Sea on January 23, 1968. 83 crew members were on board, and one was killed less than a week after Johnson announced plans for a Tet Offensive in South Vietnam. Today, this ship is used as a museum site for foreign tourists visiting the Potong River in Pyongyang. So through all of these events, pressure was being applied on the Republic of Korea and South Korea and the United States uh, for their involvement in the Vietnam War. The ongoing Cold War and we should recall what, like the North Koreans, uh, they recall this, uh, the 1953 Armistice Agreement, Chapter 13, I'm sorry, Paragraph 13D of the agreement that stipulates that no new weapons may be introduced to the peninsula. In September 1956, U.S. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Radford, indicated the United States' intention to introduce nuclear weapons into Korea, which then President Eisenhower approved. Starting in 1957, U.S. unilaterally abrogated Paragraph 13D of the Armistice Agreement and deployed Honest John missiles, atomic cannons, and nuclear-armed Matador cruise missiles to South Korea. In 1975, U.N. General Assembly attempted to dissolve the United Nations Council with a peace treaty. That was unsuccessful. Then in 1994, China withdrew from the military um, armistice commission, leaving just North Korea and the UN command as the only participants in that armistice agreement. And finally, in 1994, Kim Il-sung dies, uh, leaving a gap in that inter-Korean dialogue until 2000s uh, when it was reopened under Kim Dae-jung, the president that I mentioned in the previous presentation who won the, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. So uh, we can talk about more current events of the, uh, the recent years under Trump, uh, if you would like, during the Q&A. But this is going to bring me to the end of my presentation. If you want to have more information about the, uh, the things that we discussed uh, so far today, um, I welcome you to visit these sites. So this is the, the first one is North Korea in the world. Uh, this is a uh, East-West Center um, administered site. The East-West Center is a very important institution looking at um, looking at developments specifically around uh, military defense issues and, and that, that kind of history out of the University of Hawaii in Honolulu. Um, their National Committee on North Korea Joint Project examines these North Korean external relations. Um, this is also a very important uh, site as well. The Wilson Center in DC has archives of mostly Soviet declassified archival documents in a project they call the North Korea International Documentation Project. So many of these things have been translated into English. Uh, some are still in the process of being translated by friends like Ben Young. The Library of Congress also has um, launch public access to 34,000 index records for articles in 18 journals from North Korea dating back to 1948. And those are also recently uh, been open to the public. So those are uh, outside of Soviet Union and, I'm sorry, outside of Russia and North Korea, they are the largest uh, body of North Korean periodicals um, in the world. And if you're interested in North Korean culture and what North Koreans uh, visually consume, uh, you can check out these North Korean movies on YouTube. 
uh, through this link here. There are se currently 77 North Korean movies in full length with full English subtitles there. The, that, has, that number has dwindled from 200 a few years ago. Some of those have been taken down and it was 80 and then now it's 77. So make sure you check that out quickly if you are interested in looking at North Korean movies. Um, and uh, I will stop there and take your questions. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Wong. Um, we did have a number of questions come in, so we'll go through some of those now. And uh, Bill Smith had a few starting pretty early. So um, the first one he had, with the Kim family in control for so many years, many in North Korea must think that it's the only way of life. Do we have any idea of what anti-Kim groups exist now? And having major enemy like the United States must be important to the Kim regime and discussions with Trump must have enhanced Kim's position. So is this a mm. Yeah, those are those are great questions. Very, uh, they're speculative questions. I think uh, in some ways difficult to answer. Um, the anti Kim groups in in North Korea certainly they, they do exist. Um, there are uh, there is a, a small number of uh, scholars that are doing research around the the administrative structure and the changes into the government administrative structure in North Korea. Um, uh, the Seoje, let's see. Um, I will give you, Bill, if you want to send me an email, I will send you the name of a, a, a source of a book that uh, outlines some of that in a really interestingly published book out of Lesserton Press. Um, the idea that I, I think is probably most salient is that there are a number of, of branches or, or factions of government in North Korea that Kim Il-sung, I'm sorry, the Kim family is not the only uh, power that governs over, over operations in Korea, in North Korea, uh, but that those, they actually have to vet their interests alongside these different factions. And so um, the, the factions, the number of people that are on top of those factions and, and calling the shots are probably pretty small, but that there are some conflicts of interest between them and that it's not just a one man show. And so anti-Kim groups would probably not ever come out and say that they are anti-Kim groups. They, that would not serve in their own best interest. But there, are, there have been um, instances of conflict um, in between the last administration, the Kim Jong-il and the Kim Jong-un administration um, with, between those groups as well. Some say that those were much more pronounced. The divisions were much more pronounced under Kim Jong-un or Kim Jong-il than they were with the current administration, Kim Jong-un. Um, but uh, we will see because there, there's been a lot of uh, stirrings about the health of the current uh, leader of the Workers' Party, Kim Jong-un. So what will happen there? Um, <clears throat> Having a major enemy like the United States is important to the Kim regime. Uh, yes, absolutely. That's written all over in uh, all throughout uh, North Korean historiography is the injustices by the United States against the Korean people. Um, but I'm not sure if that idea of the U.S. as a major enemy was enhanced by the meetings with Trump. Um, in fact, I would say perhaps the opposite uh, that that those those summits with with Trump have um, enhanced uh, North Korean relationships with the United States to a large extent. While they may not have garnered the United States uh, the the um, demands that they were hoping to uh, get some agreements on, um, they certainly opened up a dialogue. And from the newspapers that came out and the, the, the media press coverage of those as a result of those summits from the North Korean perspective demonstrated that that relationship was actually moving in a positive direction. And so I would say that it might be the opposite. I mean, at least an ambivalent, more of an ambivalent position, if not moving towards a more positive um, light uh, with their relationship to the United States. <clears throat> 
Okay, and this is a bit of a difficult question to answer. So I'm glad that you have some extra resources. I'm sure, sure those will come in handy. Um, and I know that you touched a little bit on the economies of North and South Korea. And um, so that's the following question that Bill had. How do the economies of North and South compare? And is there a good measure of how the economy of the North of the economy of the North or are they so isolated that numbers are meaningless? Is there data for a GNP per capita? Mm. Um, well, today, uh, the South Korean economy is, uh, is doing incredibly well. Um, as, as you know, those, that data is there. On North Korea, it's, it is much more difficult um, to, to, get, to gather that data. I would say that I'm not sure if it's meaningless, but it's not entirely um, reliable the data that we're getting on the North Korean economy. Um, there are a few people that are working on this. Um, the uh, so again, if uh, if Bill, you want to ask me those questions in an email, I'd be happy to to shoot you out some sources there. But um, there are there are some instances where people reporters have gone to North Korea. Um, to try to get a, a glean a, a, a sense of that. Um, but if you want to see some examples of North Korean development, there are some interesting developments that we do have a, some access to. So if you go to if you go to the uh, this uh, the Hamong area, um, you can you can see that there are, um, you know, this these developments in, in indigenous industries. Uh, this is Vinilon factory, which is their their locally made uh, synthetic fiber industry, um, and they do give tours of, of these sites. There's also Kezong, which is the kind of economic uh, kind of center for um, inter-Korean uh, economic collaboration along the the just right near the border of the demilitarized zone that uh, that has become well established in the past several years and so those areas do have some limited access but if you have a, a intentional desire to to visit to see how those industries are developing they do give provide tours for those specific um, agendas so uh, there have been uh, there have been some publications on that, um, but the vast majority of the, I would have to warn you that the vast majority of the publications that we have seen on uh, North Korean economy um, are based on somewhat uh, tenuous data. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, um, Bill, I know you had a couple more questions here, but I'm gonna move down. Um, to another question from David that says, it appears that North Korea leadership is not averse to using violence and assassination to secure its position. Do you have comments about this characteristic? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I would say it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure um, about the characteristic. It's a, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, it's deplorable to know that that, that, is, that, that, that happens. In North Korea, um, the uh, the violence and assassination um, reports are, I think, they do happen, but they are not frequent. <laughs> they are quite occasional and quite strategic. Um, it's not the, um, I guess, the common solution to a lot of their their political um, uh, maneuverings. In the country um, and so I wouldn't say that it happens on mass which would be the kind of idea that many Americans uh, believe um, and that includes you know things like uh, death camps and those types of uh, very um, horrendous uh, stories that we are hearing from uh, refugee reports on North Korea um, those are, uh, I'm not saying they don't exist, but the extent to which the Korean population is being decimated by those types of assassination strategies, um, I think um, should be thrown into question, just if for no other reason than to say that, that you can't sustain a country 
uh, through those types of practices. And so, um, yeah, it's something to, to think about. But uh, sure, certainly, um, I wouldn't I wouldn't support any country uh, to have take on those types of uh, political practices. Well, thank you. Um, and then there, uh, I think it looks like the rest of these maybe, um, Bill, I don't want to cut you short. I just want to make sure that uh, the ones that we can um, answer on screen and the other ones might be more of a discussion to be had um, later using some of the resources that Dr. Wong has given us. Um, so if no one has any other further questions, Dr. Wong, I want to thank you again for joining us. Yes, thank you so much. Um, it has been a great week, a very informative week, and we appreciate you spending extra time with us today and extra prep and everything that goes into a program. Um, thank you everyone who has joined us this week. Again, if you'd like to watch the programs, they are available on our Facebook and our website. And I've said this a couple times already this week, but we will be sending out a review of the virtual Chautauqua lecture season. So we'll be sending out a survey, we'll be posting that online. And if you've attended any of our programs this summer, we'd really appreciate your feedback and suggestions for the future as we move forward, trying to figure out what we can do with the season that we've had um, and, and possibly bringing back folks in the future. So please join us next week. We're gonna be starting our week on great composers and that will begin with Dr. Charles McGuire from Oberlin College. And he'll be discussing what makes a great composer great. Um, so with that, thank you again, Dr. Wong. It's great to see you. Thanks. Hopefully we'll have you at Lakeside in the future. Yes, and I hope that everybody stays safe during the season. Mm -hmm. I wish you well. Mm -hmm. Thank you and, very much. All right. Well, we're sending everyone our love from Lakeside, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week.